All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, so my name is Michael McNally, and I'm here on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Deanna Taylor, who can't join us, uh, and Rob McMahon, who can't make it as well. Uh, we're going to see Kyle Napier uh, interspliced into the presentation at various points. Uh, and we're here to talk today about uh, Digital NWT, which was a multifaceted, government-funded project to do digital literacy in what uh, most of us would call the Northwest Territories, uh, but what is better perhaps known as Denende and Inuvialuit uh, Nunanagat. Uh. Well, hello everyone with the Open Education Global 2023 meeting in Edmonton, Alberta. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I look forward very much to uh, discussions as they unfold uh, based on the topics and the, and the presentation uh, and the presentations that you've been privy to uh, during Open Education Global. My name is Kyle Napier. I'm from Fort Smith Northwest Territories. I'm excited to co-present. Uh, I'm excited to co-present with uh, with Michael McNally. And uh, Kyle also forgot to mention too that he's a, a part-time instructor here at Norquest as well. Uh, so I want to begin with a land acknowledgement, and of course uh, acknowledging that, that I and many of my colleagues who worked on this project are based here in Amiskwichi Wiskiyagan, uh, which is Treaty Six territory, Métis Region Four. Um, but also that much of this work took place on lands uh, that are made up uh, by the Inuvialuit, the Gwich'in, the Sautu, the Dene, uh, the Decho, the Tlicho, and the Akaicho, uh, and Métis people who inhabit uh, the Northwest Territories. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of those uh, tensions in relation to uh, how we tried to uh, incorporate and reflect uh, Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing into some of the work we did in the project. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the challenges involved in creating these resources. Uh, and then in the second piece, I really want to draw on, uh, on two frameworks. Uh, one is Hagerty's uh, Open Pedagogy Framework that I think most people are familiar with. Uh, and the other is Larson's six R's for Indigenous OERs. And of course, if you're not familiar with Kayla's work, uh, she's going to be the keynote speaker on Wednesday morning. Uh, so this project was a multi-partner project brought together by a range of uh, institutions. Uh, at the upper level, it was governed by four Indigenous governments, so the Gwich'in Tribal Council, the Sawtooth Renewable Resources Board, the Tlicho Government, and the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation. Uh, in turn, those four governments partnered with Computers for Schools in the Northwest Territories, the Smart Community Society in the Northwest Territories, and Aurora College, which is the only post-secondary in the Northwest Territories, along with the University of Alberta and Hands-On Media Education, uh, to develop and deliver the digital NWT program. This was funded by Government of Canada, Innovation, Science, and Economic Development specifically. Uh, and just so that everyone knows, this was a $3 million project. So it was a, a well-resourced project. Uh, and the entire project was ultimately uh, undertaken and governed by Makeway, which uh, you might know previously as the Tides Foundation in Canada. Uh, they provided the platform and a kind of operation uh, for the project. So many stakeholders involved. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Kyle here to, uh, to talk a little bit about the approach and initiatives. As Michael has just addressed, this project wouldn't be possible without project partners and the steering committee. We took a multifold consideration in our approaches and initiatives. Uh, so we thought about capacity sharing among these. And so we featured digital innovators made up of predominantly Indigenous change makers across the Northwest Territories. These are Juno award-winning artists, these are creatives, these are movie makers, these are people experimenting with virtual reality or storytelling in different ways. And so we showed and demonstrated the types of uh, skills and capacity already coming out of the Northwest Territories. Uh, we also developed courses and delivered them with community partners and community trainers. And this is through a train the trainer approach. We ended up including all of the research that emerged from um, you know, our, our calls out to the public and putting it together as a submission to the, the CRTC. And, and so that was put forward in, in 2020 and it addressed um, you know, barriers to uh, internet access, the digital divide as experienced by um, Northerners and, and particularly uh, Indigenous people residing in, the, in, in remote and rural communities in the Northwest Territories. 
Uh, and again, Kyle's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, context and, uh, and challenges and, of course, a project doing digital literacy uh, in the Northwest Territories where there's very poor connectivity. Uh, and COVID happened in the middle of this was not without its uh, share of challenges. A major focus of, in our work with Digital NWT was addressing the digital divide and then responding to it. Uh, O'Donnell and Beaton in 2018 write about uh, the paradox of telecommunications. In addressing the digital divide among the Northwest Territories, we realized that the communities which would benefit the most from access to telecommunications had the least amount of access to, tele uh, to telecommunication services. And this was particularly highlighted during, um, during COVID-19. So in realizing that this was an, indeed an issue, we put forward solutions that responded to this issue. And this included various efforts in creating uh, intranet uh, hubs um, for communities to put forward their own community networks, um, which wouldn't rely on the internet, but rather local uh, connectivity. In doing so, communities maintain sovereignty um, over their own programming and, uh, and locally accessible telecommunications uh, and of course, one of the other big challenges is a lack of uh, really uh, northern reflective openly licensed content. Uh, so a lot of uh, content uh, that's freely available through various open uh, repositories doesn't reflect uh, life uh, and, and ways of living in the north. Uh, and so we at, at one point found we found a, a lot of good content uh, that has, was particularly northern uh, looking. Uh, and then we discovered all the, we, we could see language in the uh, markers of, of signs in behind, and we discovered all the signs were in Russian because it had come out of northern Russia uh, someplace. So we faced a lot of challenges uh, finding, you know, content uh, that was, was truly reflective uh, for the learners of the way that they live. Uh, in terms of the curriculum, uh, it was made up of three different courses with varying numbers of modules. Uh, the first course started with really basic digital literacy uh, to the point where the, one of the opening slides was, you know, what's the difference between a laptop and a desktop and a smartphone uh, and a tablet. Uh, it then worked through a module on the internet. Of course, that was a, a big area for uh, northern residents is understanding things like speed and bandwidth. Uh, we then had a whole module on social media and then a module on um, what was called being proactive online. Uh, it was really about online safety, but when we were working with community members, we were actually told, don't talk about online safety because many of the people attending courses uh, that run from Aurora College and community settings in the Northwest Territories don't come from safe environments and communities themselves. There's a lot of women especially who are facing or living with uh, domestic abuse. So we actually uh, dropped references to safety and, and paralleling online safety with physical safety uh, altogether. In the second course, uh, we had an introductory uh, kind of set of activities and content around creating digital content, walking through people through some basic uh, open source office tools, uh, OpenOffice and LibreOffice in particular. Uh, and then we had an interactive uh, guided learning exercise where people would make uh, maps of their community or use maps of their community in 3D printed pieces and plan out uh, community networks. Uh, and then in the third course, which was really kind of the highlight, the crown jewel of the curriculum, because we kind of knew what we were doing best by that time, uh, we ran a digital storytelling course. And so each of these courses was about uh, 12 hours in terms of length. Uh, we did ultimately work towards building a community networks course, uh, but unfortunately the project uh, wasn't uh, funded uh, in the future to go through this. And in terms of what we did, there's slides, there's guides, there's activities, there's videos. I think all told, it was about 188 different files within the curriculum, all openly licensed. So uh, this gives you a sense here of the, the curriculum. This is a summary table uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, there was, for each course, a facilitator guide. This was a pedagogical instrument. It teaches, it walks people through how to teach. Uh, so for every slide, there would be uh, some notes about, you know, what you might want to consider in teaching that. And in some cases, it's very basic, like this slide compares desktops to laptops. Uh, be sure to note, you know, these key differences, or you might want to ask this question. In other cases, the facilitator guide might be much longer. So in 
Being proactive online and in digital storytelling, we were well aware of the history of trauma in these communities. So there might be an extended discussion in the facilitator guide saying, you know, before you get people to tell a digital story, you need to be aware that some of those stories are going to deal with people uh, covering their own traumatic histories. Uh, and you need to you know, think of the different supports uh, for them. And of course, we'd include uh, material like that. So, all told, across all three courses, there were almost 500 pages of pedagogical guides. They accompanied over a thousand slides. So this was a very large curriculum. Uh, and then there were a number of additional materials. We had a number of videos. Uh, we also included maps and 3D printed files at various points. Uh, so all told, uh, you know, an extensive range. We also had activity books, uh, which were very uh, introductory, things like word searches, matching exercises, uh, and we were told specifically by adult educators and community members that these were the act types of activities that they wanted. So uh, despite being a digital literacy course uh, or series of courses, we had a lot of pen and paper activities, uh, and that was also a recognition too that for some of the learners, uh, they might be trying to do the activity book at home and wouldn't have necessarily uh, the bandwidth to want to do rich digital activities. So all of the curriculum is made available on the Digital NWT website. Uh, it's all openly licensed. Uh, there's different licenses for some different things, but most of it's under a CC BY NC, so uh, Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial 4.0 license. Uh, one of the challenges is because it's so many files, it just sits in a Google Drive. Uh, I supposedly don't have time to describe metadata for 188 files. I just I don't have time to archive each one individually. So it's, it's poor discoverability, and I'll be the first to uh, admit that. Uh, we used a couple of different licenses in a few different places. Uh, so most of it was under CC BY NC. Um, we did do some 3D printing for the community networking equipment, which we ultimately never built a course for. Uh, that came under a CC BY NC SA license, uh, and that's in part because we were using materials that already had that same share-alike license. Uh, and then I think the last one is really interesting, the digital innovator videos, and on the next slide, Kyle will, uh, will talk to these. These were four or five minute videos featuring various tech champions from across the Northwest Territories, and we really tried to think through you know, how do we deal with the intellectual property in these in a way that balances open, uh, as well as concerns with uh, you know, the indigenous knowledge creators and the communities from which these come. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to Kyle to talk a little bit about these, and this is the copyright and licensing information uh, slide that would appear at the end uh, for the various videos. This one uh, for Agnes Mitchell's video in particular. Thank you, Michael. And on the topic of digital innovators and, and tech champions, we wanted to ensure that uh, sovereignty and um, copyright was retained by uh, the Indigenous knowledge holders that we were featuring in not only our, our digital innovator videos, but across all the content that we were including and so here's just one example. This was actually drafted by Michael McNally and, uh, and approved among our team. And uh, this is an example featuring Agnes Mitchell, who is a, a Gwich'in elder um, and, and a musician. And so we wanted to recognize all of the rights um, to the music and, um, and the representation of, uh, of Agnes Mitchell in that we were just the stewards of the video. She actually retains the, the rights um, to her own voice and imagery and performance uh, as it relates to uh, this digital innovator video. And of course, in that uh, second course on digital content, uh, where we actually talk about copyright, it was one of the, the units within the module, uh, we really tried to unpack that, that problem that you know, Western IP is fundamentally incompatible with uh, traditional indigenous ways of knowing and, and the way uh, knowledge has been stewarded. Uh, so we, you know, we're kind of constantly struggling throughout the project with how do we both teach about open licensing and promote open licensing, uh, but then not at the same time uh, appropriate or exploit uh, others' uh, intellectual property. And so we really tried here to, to balance that uh, in, a, in a somewhat complicated way. Uh, but to show that you know, these, there are two systems at work here, and of course, everything from the digital NWT project was openly licensed, but what had come from community members, we wanted to ensure that they retained uh, their rights and, uh, and were recognized. So turning then to, uh, to thinking about the project, 
Uh, this was, as you probably saw, with a number of slides and pages of facilitator guides, uh, and we were trying to run this in, uh, there's 33 communities in the Northwest Territories, and we were never uh, operating in all of those communities, but we were all, you know, trying to run this in 14, 15 of the communities at a time. Uh, there was a lot going on, uh, but we had in the back of our mind uh, Hegarty's framework in particular. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the eight uh, attributes of open pedagogy. Uh, what's, I think, really notable about this uh, framework from Hegarty in particular is it doesn't actually center OER specifically. It has eight facets, uh, all of which relate to open pedagogy, uh, but they don't necessarily, you know, you could, you, you could use Hegarty's framework and not actually use OERs. Uh, you could use it, uh, it could be detached. Um, we were also doing most, much of this work thinking about things about relationship with community uh, and it wasn't until uh, 2021 when Larson, Kayla Larson first articulated her six R's that we were able to really say, yeah, this is a lot of uh, the same ideas we'd been thinking about. So Kayla's uh, six R's, and of course they were adapted from uh, UBC's four R's for education and, and a play on uh, David Wiley's five R's, uh, respect for indigenous cultural identity, communities and topics, uh, relationships connects to the concept of all our relations and building relations with communities, Responsibility, responsibility to share only when we are allowed and to publish in an ethical way while considering uh, ownerships, protocols, and community practices. Uh, reverence, respect for the sacred, relevant, uh, legitimize and incorporate indigenous knowledges into the curriculum when it makes sense. And reciprocity, both receiving and giving with communities. And so particularly as we got to the digital storytelling course, we were really starting to think about you know, how does what Kayla is thinking and talking about reflect our thinking and, uh, and what we've been doing. Uh, so in terms of Hegarty's uh, framework, we found uh, at different points throughout the, the curriculum and the project as a whole, we really touched on all eight uh, aspects of the, uh, the framework. So we, we've used participatory technology. We actually, because of the partnership with Computers for Schools, gave all of the learners a free refurbished government laptop uh, and then I'll quietly say in this room and hope no one is listening from the government, some of those laptops were pieces of crap uh, and didn't work that well. So that was a limitation of the project. But uh, by and large, we were able to, to address some of that device level digital divide. Uh, we encouraged creativity, digital storytelling, I think is an example. Uh, sharing of resources and ideas also ties into that. Um, in terms of connected community, for example, we were talking about uh, not only social media connections in that first course, but the network level interconnections uh, as well. So trying to include you know, something like broadband literacy as part of digital literacy. Uh, there were learner generated materials, so the digital stories themselves uh, in the third course, and there were other digital artifacts people might create through the uh, second course in particular. Uh, and peer review is a really important one for us. So we used uh, you know, community review uh, wherever we could. So we'd have uh, Indigenous community members review the materials and comment on them. Uh, we were using a train-the-trainer approach, so we had Aurora College instructors reviewing materials. We would use, when we could get available time, and that was a very uh, difficult resource to get, uh, the steering committee members to go through the resources and comment on them. And we learned many, you know, incredibly insightful things. Like I mentioned, uh, you know, not making the analogy to online safety. At one point, we were going to talk a lot about uh, gambling and online gambling, the dangers of online gambling. We thought this is probably pretty relevant. And uh, we were actually told in, uh, in one of the some of the communities that gambling uh, in person is a very pro-social activity. And, and they didn't want uh, content problematizing online gambling, so we, we didn't cover online gambling. So uh, things that we thought, you know, clearly, clearly, you know, this would make sense, really using the peer review to, uh, to get back. And so there you can see a slide uh, from the end of the digital storytelling course. So over uh, the six, uh, or over the 12 hours, people using uh, a combination of open tools, and I, I will say ultimately we used Microsoft Video Editor. Uh, because of the, the learning level required was at the level of our students. We looked at open uh, video editing uh, programs and actually we ended up going with the, the Microsoft one. Uh, it's not open, but it was on all the computers. Uh, so using that, uh, we'd send people to, uh, to open repositories to get uh, music or images or they could create their own. 
uh, and they'd ultimately you know, narrate as well. They'd use the voice recorder program in the computer, and they'd create these short little digital stories. Uh, and then we talked about, of course, the implications of sharing those stories, whether it was in a room or, or more broadly. And there would be ultimately a, a film festival at the end. Um, in terms of aligning with Kayla's work, and uh, you know, there were some challenges in this. First, we had done a lot of the work before Kayla articulated her framework, so uh, it was more of seeing where that alignment existed than having Kayla's framework uh, in advance. Uh, another piece, too, is it's important to keep in mind 95% of the content in digital NWT was not uh, indigenous knowledges. It was uh, you know, information about computers, information about networks, information uh, that we were trying to work with communities to provide. And of course, the, the steering committee, the indigenous governments wanted this kind of education in their communities. Uh, we did, though, at times find places for it. So uh, on the far left is a slide there uh, featuring Nigitil Norbert. Uh, Nigitil is an illustrator based in Inuvik. And uh, Nijitzel created this beautiful artwork for us on a canvas tent. Uh, in working with Jenny Vandermeer, who is a resident uh, of the territory, she had done some work on digital storytelling before, and she had said, you know, don't go in and teach it as pre-production, production, post-production, post which is your typical arc of how you create a story or how you create a video. She said, you know, maybe there's a different way we can tell uh, or relate to digital storytelling. And so Jenny Vandermeer, working with uh, Jesse Carell, who was from Hands On Media, one of the pro project partners, uh, they came up with this uh, canvas tent analogy about how telling a digital story is like putting a canvas tent together. And then, uh, so that gave a, a northern context to the, uh, the digital story. And then Njitsil was able to create these beautiful images. So. Uh, in the lower, or in the center, uh, that lower kind of image of the, the tent, uh, that's uh, an image from the uh, end of the course, you know, the wood stove of the canvas tent is the part of the digital story where we acknowledge others. Uh, so we, you know, talking about giving credit, uh, you know, copyright side of things we might, or library side of things we might think about citations, uh, we ultimately summed it up as a wood stove within this canvas tent analogy. Uh, that worked really well in course number three, and I think that's where we see the strongest alignment of Kayla's thinking and the project's own success. Uh, in some of the earlier uh, material, I, I still struggle to this day to, you know, what does decolonizing the difference between a laptop and a desktop look like? Um, you know, to some degree, uh, I, we continue to struggle with that. Uh, but we would often try and highlight northern-based uh, examples. So we had the digital innovator videos. Uh, on the lower right-hand side, you can see we're talking about digital catalogs. This is from course number two. And of course, we highlight the uh, GTCs. Uh, they have a catalog dealing with uh, plant biology, so local plants. Wherever possible, we would point to what's going on in the territory uh, and try and have a, a local example. Uh, and, and generally, we were able to find local examples of pretty much everything we were talking about, whether it was social media stars to data breaches. We found uh, examples of where this was happening in the territory. So um, some good alignment with, uh, with Kayla's thinking. Uh, and, and I've had the good chance of talking with Kayla this morning. I, I know Kayla well. Uh, I really think her framework does provide a really rich uh, framework for thinking about how one can work uh, with indigenous communities, not just if it's uh, indigenous uh, knowledge subject matter, but if you're working with community on a, on a kind of more Western or, or other area of information. Uh, so I've got some time for questions. I again want to thank the uh, Gwich'in Tribal Council, the Satu Renewable Resources Board, the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation, and the Tlichio government. Uh, without their time, energy, staff, uh, and their people, uh, this wouldn't have been possible, uh, and of course, as well, funding from the uh, the government of Canada. And I'm happy to take uh, any. Oh, and Kyle's got a thank you too. And as with Michael's appreciation to the steering committee, I also appreciate you and your time and consideration in uh, understanding how we put forward open access resources um, and co-developed um, open access resources with uh, remote and rural communities across the Northwest Territories. Hope you enjoy the rest of your time at the Open Education Global. Uh, conference and uh, looking forward to the discussions that flow from this. Masicho. So I'm happy to take any questions.
Yes. So the question was, how do we reconcile the idea of stories and knowledge being owned by everyone uh, with at the same time uh, respecting intellectual property rights and, and promoting uh, open licensing? And I think in the digital storytelling course, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, after, after people have produced the stories, so you know, they've done the, the mechanical elements of pulling everything together, uh, there's a series of slides talking about um, you know, ideas of uh, sharing with others and what does that what does that mean and what needs to be done so the the wood stove idea was the the framework through which we uh, tried to unpack uh, ideas of ownership to some extent and ideas of licensing uh, the wood stove being the key piece that ends up heating the tent uh, and making it uh, making it warm and inviting and so uh, we talked a little bit about that and we would always give people too the opportunity when they were creating stories to not share their story. For some people, just the process of going through and creating the digital story is what they want, and they don't want to show it, whether that's um, within the little classroom where it's being held, uh, or, or more broadly. And so, and we always, you know, with the, the social media side of things, unpacking some of the implications of what happens if you put a Creative Commons license on this and put this out there in the world, well then it, it can be transformed and remade and, and who knows. So. We tried to talk through some of that uh, in the, the slides uh, through that third course. Yeah. So the question was, do we have uh, a sense of how these have improved digital literacy? Uh, and actually we did. So one of the requirements from the Government of Canada uh, was that we do pre and post testing. Uh, and that was largely a demographic collection of information that the, that's what Government of Canada wanted, I said, Innovation Science and Economic Development. We asked specific questions. Now they were affective, qualitative questions. Do you feel that your digital literacy has improved? Uh, and throughout all of the courses, uh, we would always see an increase in uh, you know, confidence, uh, feelings from the pretest to the post-test. So there was always some evidence that, uh, that these courses were viewed by the participants as, uh, as in enhancing. Uh, we also would do pre and post-tests with the, uh, the instructors as well from Aurora College, and they generally agreed that the courses uh, were, were valuable. Uh, you know, one of the challenges is these were, um, you know, they're, they're not for credit, uh, they're optional courses. Uh, so they often run with, uh, with a handful of learners in the classroom, like three, four, five. Uh, so you know, it's, it's difficult to say if there are any large, uh, you know, major gains, but certainly within the pre and post testing, we did see evidence of, uh, of people feeling that they knew more. Yes? Uh, so the way the courses were structured is uh, course one, two, and three each ran as their own separate 12-hour course. Um, courses two and three were, were effectively linear. Uh, linear. Like you, you, you took digital storytelling, you do digital storytelling for 12 hours. Uh, course number one, there was actually more content than could possibly be instructed in 12 hours. And so the way we dealt with that is we, uh, it, was, it was feedback from the Aurora College instructors that said, let's run it a la carte. So they would meet with their learners and they'd say, we could talk about internet, we could talk about uh, misinformation online, we could talk about social media, what do you want to learn about? And then the course would be structured for those learners. Uh, and so I think that worked relatively well as a way to, uh, to meet the learners where they were. Everyone got all of the course materials uh, on a USB, in fact, that was one of the things I didn't, uh, didn't mention. Uh, to get around some of the broadband restrictions, uh, I would mail boxes full of USBs to tiny little communities, uh, along with all the printed curricular materials. We'd print 
uh, everything as well just to get around broadband. So you could go to course one, you could learn about social media, for example, but you'd still have all the rest of the curriculum. And you'd have that facilitator guide, which could teach you some of it. Uh, we tried to keep the materials, at a, the slides at a grade three level, which was uh, guidance from uh, Aurora College that that's uh, the level we should be creating materials at. The facilitator guide, often we couldn't keep that at, uh, at uh, a grade three level. It's time for one more question, I think. Uh, the demographic is actually, it's, it's uh, fascinating. Uh, it's primarily uh, older individuals, uh, but some younger individuals as well. So we had, you know, anyway, you had to be 18, but 18 all the way up to 70. Uh, and we were in, we had the most success, and this goes back to that telecom uh, paradox of telecommunications. We had the most success in the high Western Arctic. So communities like Inuvik, Aklavik, uh, Tukteaktuk, et cetera where these, uh, you know, they're, they're furthest away from uh, Yellowknife or Alberta or British Columbia. And so that's where we tended to run most of these courses. So very remote contexts, uh, often with, uh, you know, like I said, a handful of learners in each session, uh, but usually a, a mix of age. Sometimes when you advertise you're giving away a free computer, people come, uh, but, but often with uh, more senior members of the community. And we knew going in that device ownership rates were, uh, you know, 66% in some communities. So two thir one third of the community didn't have a computer or a smartphone or any sort of digital device. So thank you very much. Uh, and that's all of my time. So thank you all.